Good morning, church. Man, you guys just love each other so well. Same as last week. Good morning, church. My name is Kevin Huddleston. I'll be leading us in the liturgy this morning. And this is Jared and the band. They'll be leading us in worship. Let's rise. Let's hear God call us to worship him this morning. And before I do, I know that we come in here with a lot in our minds and hearts. Some of us have just, just hopped in out of a car. Some of us have dropped off our kids. And so we bring a very busyness in our minds and hearts with us into this room. And so sometimes we, we miss God calling us to worship him. And so I just wanna give us a second to take a deep breath, to let your mind and heart catch up with your body being in this room. And the scriptures even describe something like this as calming and quieting our souls. So I just want to speak that into the room and say, Lord, would you calm and quiet our souls this morning? Would you ready our hearts to receive your word? And so let's hear God's word call us to worship him from the book of Revelation. I am the Alpha and the Omega says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let's worship him together, church. Oh, praise you, 
God's covenant love, God's goodness is what holds us and preserves us, which is good because our loves are actually really weak. Our loves are actually pretty selfish. But God's mercy enables us to be honest with him about that. So let's join our voices now and confess our sins using these words. Christ our Lord, we confess today the weakness of our adoration. Our hearts are prone to distraction and to selfishness. Our loves are disordered. We have failed to give you the glory you deserve. Forgive us, we pray, and remind us this morning of your steadfast love for your people. Renew us by your Holy Spirit that our hearts might overflow with love, peace, and joy. Amen. Hear now God's words of pardon and peace to his people from Jeremiah chapter 31. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So to all who hope in Jesus Christ this morning, I declare to you that your sins are forgiven and they are remembered no more. This is the good news of the gospel. So rest in it and be at peace. Trust 
in faith across time and space and history, and the historic creeds are actually part of the way we express that unity with other believers across time and history. And so today we're going to be using the Nicene Creed and professing our faith using these historic words. So let's profess our faith together. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, of the same essence as the Father, through whom all things came into being, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, and suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets. And we believe in one holy, universal, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look in hope for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 
Well, as an expression of this unity that we have with one another, why don't you take a moment and just greet those around you. Well, friends, again, my name is Kevin Huddleston. I'm very glad that you're here this morning. And I'm especially glad because you know what I see as I look out across this room? It's not going to surprise you. I see a whole bunch of human beings. Am I right? You're like, wow, shocker. You spent all week working on that line. Good one. No, I say that because as human beings, the beautiful reality of, of us in this room is that we are all unique. We all have different cultural backgrounds and family backgrounds. And really, an easy way to summarize our differences is to say we each have a story. Every one of us brings a different story into this room with them. And so the beauty of being human is that we are story formed. You've got chapters of your life, of your story that have shaped you. And just like any story, some of those chapters are really rich and beautiful and amazing and fun to retell. And then there's other chapters of that story that are hard, that are dark, that are difficult that are broken. And when God revealed himself to human beings, thankfully, he also came into the world with a story. Jesus had a story. And that's the beauty of the gospel is that God has come into the world into a story and is remaking the world through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so the good news of the gospel is that Jesus' story can actually become your story. And that doesn't mean you have to forget your story or leave your story behind, but it means that your story can get brought up in and get caught up in the this story of the gospel. And that story is a shared story. So in a, in a world that's very individualistic that wants to talk about you, you matter, but you matter to God and God's people. And so part of the beauty of being a story form people is that you get to be a part of a new community. And in order to get to know other people's story and for your story to be known, Sunday mornings can only really be a, a first step. So we want to invite you to be a part of a community of people so that your story can be known, and not just to others, but also to God. And so let me just share a few ways that you can get better connected to other people and other community at Quorumdale. So first, you can sign up for our weekly email. It goes out every Monday, and you can sign up on the front page of our website, cdomaha.com. Second, you can also text Connect Me to that number you see here on the screen, and that goes to Ryan Meyer. He's our director of connections, and either him or someone from his connections crew will follow up with you this week. And then finally, you can stop by the connection desk on the way out uh, in the atrium there. There's a number of volunteers and leaders that have green name tags, and they'd love to, to stop and hear your story and get to know you better and help you get connected. And then finally, as an expression of hospitality, we don't take an offering during the, the gathering in here. Instead, there's an offering box on your way out on the left, and we just trust that if you are a follower of Jesus, if you're a disciple, that you are uh, honoring the Lord with generous giving. And so now we have a chance to pray as a church, and today we'll be praying for the Well Church in Hastings, Nebraska. Pastor Joe Marino, and he specifically asked that I give his personal Blessing and greeting to the people of Quorumdale. He's so thankful for your support and friendship and partnership in the gospel over these many years. And so let's pray together for these dear friends and our extended church family. And at the conclusion, we'll uh, actually recite the Lord's Prayer together. So join me now as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, your words remind us that every human being is created in your image, that our diversity reflects your beauty and glory. And so it is with heavy hearts that we actually begin our prayers this morning with lament over the tragic shooting in Buffalo, New York last Saturday. Jesus, would you heal the brokenness of this situation? Would you give hope where there is hopelessness and light in the darkness? And Spirit, bring comfort to the Buffalo community in the coming weeks and months. Lord, may your kingdom come on earth there as it is in heaven. Father, we bring the well church before you now. 
And we thank you that you have established this community in a particular place with a particular people for your particular kingdom purposes. So, Spirit, we ask that you would open hearts in Hastings to the proclamation of your gospel through the Well Church family. In particular, would you enliven their vision for kingdom living through their mission and values sermons, and, and even this summer as they jump into the Psalms as we will, would you renew their hearts? Lord, we ask you to bear much fruit and bring many to faith through the Well's faithfulness. Father, we thank you for Pastor Joe. We thank you for calling him to Jesus and for equipping him for the work of shepherding your people. In spirit, we ask that you would bring rest and renewal to him, his family, and the entire church family in these uh, coming summer months. Restore to them the joy of their salvation and renew in them a deep, abiding sense of your presence. Finally, Father, we thank you for the ways you've established this church and Lord, we ask you to continue to make it sustainable for the long haul. We, we long for decades, not just days, for this church family to be salt and light and hastings. And so, Lord, please give them their daily bread regarding things like facilities and finances. We know that walls cannot contain you and money is not our master. But Lord, we ask you to graciously pour out your provision on this church. We humbly ask you to bring them to a place of financial sustainability this year, if it be your will. And now we pray together as your church. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is John chapter 1, verses 35 through 43. It's on page 833 in the Bibles under your seats. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. The word of God for the people of God. My name is Dusty White. I serve here as one of the pastors. It's great to be with you. The simple way that we describe the mission of Cormdale Church is like this. We say Cormdale Church exists to worship God, make disciples, plant churches, and spur gospel renewal everywhere. And today, I want to talk about that little phrase, make disciples. Just that little phrase. What does that mean, and why is that essential to Christian faith? When I was uh, first starting off in ministry, I had landed an internship at a nearby church, and uh, my goal in this whole internship was to just get my feet wet in ministry, to check it out, and to learn as much as I possibly could. And one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to be discipled. Uh, I had had some discipleship along the way from some people who had definitely invested in me, but I'd never entered into kind of this free reign discipleship relationship where I just said, hey, I need somebody to disciple me. 
So I went into a, a pastor's office at that church that I trusted, and I said, hey, I need to be discipled. And I was in my young 20s, and he probably thought, yeah, you do. That's a good idea. And so he listed three names of some gentlemen that, uh, that were in the church, two of the guys I knew. So I picked the guy I didn't know at all. I just thought, well, I'll be risky. I was a lot more risky then than I am now. And so I got his number. I called him up. He agreed. I told him my intentions. And uh, he told me where to meet him. I met him at his place of business. He owned a tire shop uh, here in Omaha. Uh, I showed up. I was directed uh, upstairs, I believe. As I remember going up these stairs to his office. We had never met. We chatted for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then he handed me a pair of leather work gloves, which were, by the way, the best leather work gloves I've ever owned. I've yet to find good, hardy leather work gloves like this guy had given me. And uh, he handed me these work gloves, and we went outside, and we proceeded uh, to roll big semi-tires around for the remainder of the day. It was a few hours, if I recall. And I remember thinking, I was looking for some sort of like spiritual investment. I had no idea that I was going to be slinging tires around all day. And that's what we did for the rest of that day. I did it a few times with him. I remember thinking, this isn't exactly what I was looking for, but it was discipleship in his world. Uh, at other times, we would sit in his truck and we would talk about life. We would talk about the scriptures. Sometimes we would pray together. Sometimes I was invited to his home. He would call me up, especially when he needed a young 20-year-old guy to move some landscaping around or do things like that. I remember painting at his house and doing random projects. There's a few times where I rode with him to smaller Nebraska towns to deliver tires, and we would get some windshield time together, and we would talk, which is really good for guys, by the way, to just get in a car and go somewhere. He didn't over-spiritualize it when I asked him to disciple me. He just invited me into his world. Or maybe I had invited myself into his world. Uh, by proxy, I had learned a lot about business, and I learned a lot about finance. I learned a lot about how to honor money and how to honor the Lord with my money. It's a relationship that I'm still grateful for today. He was really gracious. He was really kind to my wife and I. I had asked to be discipled, and he brought me into his life. And today... I have a different guy discipling me, also a man I respect and admire and am learning from. I'm still submitting myself to following because as I read the scriptures, following is essential. Here's the simple truth that I want to convince you of this morning. We must follow Jesus because following is formative. We must follow Jesus because following is formative. Look with me at John chapter 1, the scriptures that we just heard read, starting in verse 37. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. Jesus' invitation is follow me. This is the very beginning of his ministry. If you flip all the way to the end of John, uh, into John chapter 21, it says this in verses 19 through 22. After saying this, he said to him, he's talking to Peter, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciples whom Jesus loved following them. The one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Jesus' invitation at the beginning of his ministry is follow me. Jesus' invitation at the end of his ministry is follow me. Why is this what Jesus calls us to? Why is this the call? that Jesus gives us. 
Why doesn't he say, understand me with our minds, or love me with your hearts or your affection, or decide for me with all of your will? I think it's because Jesus knows something that we don't. He knows that none of those things can happen unless we are first formed through following him. We must follow Jesus because following is formative. Here's what I think we should acknowledge today. Every one of us has already been formed. We've all been shaped by a certain family of origin. We've been shaped by our culture. We've been formed and shaped by our own patterns. Whether those are good patterns or bad patterns, we all have patterns and habits. None of us comes to Jesus as a blank slate. We come to him as people who have already taken on a certain kind of shape. And you see, that makes us unable to understand the kingdom of God. We don't think as we should think. We don't love as we ought to love. And we don't will as we ought to will. And only by following him can we understand the wisdom of his kingdom and the joy of of his fellowship. The kingdom of God is not of this world. We learn that in John chapter 18. So Jesus knows that we don't have the capacity to understand him or the capacity to love him or to decide for him because we haven't been fully formed in the ways that make this possible or realistic. So Jesus just says to us, hey, follow me. Andrew and Simon, Peter, thought that they were looking for the Messiah in John. What they didn't realize was that the Messiah was looking for them. Follow me, come and see. This is Jesus' invitation to them. This is Jesus' invitation to us this morning, to simply put one foot in front of the other and follow Jesus again this morning, this afternoon, tomorrow, and into this next week. Friends, we must follow Jesus because following is formative. So, in what ways does following Jesus form us? Here's a few things that John shows us. He shows us all sorts of things, but I'll share with you a few. First of all, following Jesus forms us to embrace obedience. That's what we learn in the Gospel of John. When a little kid is about to run out into the street, a loving parent says, stop. That's what a loving parent does. And when Jesus calls the first disciples, he doesn't ask them if they would like to follow him. They see him, they begin to follow him, and he turns and notices that they're following, and they ask him where he's staying, and he doesn't answer them with knowledge of a place. He invites them to a life of finding out, because finding out requires obedience on the path of discipleship with Christ. When we're called to follow Christ, We're summoned to an exclusive attachment to Christ. Just like when you get summoned for jury duty, you show up, right? And unless you're nursing a baby, which some some of you have gotten out of jury duty with, okay, I've heard these stories. Maybe these stories are in my own home, I'm not sure. (laughs) You show up because this is your civic duty, right? You're going to do your civic duty. And as a citizen, you're summoned for jury duty. And as a disciple, you're summoned to follow Jesus. And you get to obey. When our kids were much younger at our house, uh, a phrase we would often use in our home is obey right away. Or we would say obedience is now. I think my loving wife would say obey right away because it like works and it's kind of kind. I think I would say obedience is now. That's what I used to say. Christian parents don't ask their kids to obey because it helps you enjoy a meal at a restaurant and you need to be seen as the nice people in the culture. That's not why. Christian parents ask their kids to obey right away because they're discipling their kids to grow up and obey the Lord eventually into adulthood and everything that the scripture will teach them to obey. Kids obeying isn't about parents with rules. Kids obeying is about Jesus and the disciples that those kids are becoming. But obedience is totally up for grabs right now. It's up for grabs in our culture, but it is not up for grabs with Jesus. 
Jesus calls us, and we respond to that call with our obedience. We don't think about it. We don't ponder it. We must obey. This is what the Gospel of John is telling us when it comes to discipleship. That means that we understand the Christian life as we obey. And it's only as we obey that we begin to understand Jesus and his ways start to make sense to us. His way is the good way, but we want to delay, don't we? We like to delay our obedience until we really get it, until we really understand. We remain intrigued, but hear me, it's through our obeying that we do come to understand the good life with Christ. A loving parent doesn't need their kid to know why they shouldn't run out into the street. They can totally figure that out later on. Right now, they just need them to not run out into the street simply because the parent says so. And as they grow up, they'll understand the why more later on down the road. Listen to Bonhoeffer on discipleship. He says this, with an abstract idea, it is possible to enter into a relation of formal knowledge, to become enthusiastic about it, and perhaps even to put it into practice. But it can never be followed in personal obedience. Christianity without the living Christ is inevitably Christianity without discipleship. And Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. And the Gospel of John calls us to be disciples of Jesus Christ, not just nice people with a Christian worldview. And Christian discipleship simply means that we follow Jesus when Jesus says, follow me. When he says, follow me with your relationships, we follow him. When he says, follow me with your money, follow me with your virtue, follow me with your covenantal commitment in marriage, follow me in your chastity before marriage, follow me in how you lead your company or your practice or your school, follow me in how you love your neighbor, Follow me is what Jesus says to us. The first step in the good life is a life of obedience. The disciples had to drop their nets. They had to burn their boats and embrace the insecurity and at the same time the gift of grace that Jesus was giving them and the demand that Jesus had made on their life. And so that's what the disciples model for us in the Gospel of John. I wonder for us, what do we need to drop in order to obey Jesus? The road to faith calls us to obedience. Secondly, following Jesus forms us to discern light from darkness. We read about this in John chapter 8, verse 12. It says this, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Some things are darkness, some things are light, and we need to know the difference. We learn the difference as we follow Jesus. When you start out as a disciple of Jesus, some things that you think are darkness are actually light, and some things that you think are light are actually darkness, and you figure it out along the way. Here's what I'm trying to say. Some of us are morally confused, and we have a vision of life. It's just not an accurate description of life until following Jesus aligns it for us. All of us, every single day, we're making moral judgment. This is part of what it means to be human. We're moral beings, and we can't change that at all. The problem is we're morally confused, and so is the culture. We live in a world that calls darkness light and light darkness. And the prophet Isaiah gives us a woe to this. Actually, in Isaiah 5, verse 20, he says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Friends, the world is confused. I think we can agree on that. We are confused on what is good and what is evil. 
And as we follow Jesus, he helps us to discern and unravel all of our confusion. I bet you that some of us here today are confused. If you're confused, that is fine. Christ welcomes the confused, okay? And this can be your place. If you're here today and you're like, actually, yeah, that actually describes me pretty well. I'm kind of confused. I'm perplexed about a lot of the circumstances in my life and about a lot of things that I'm feeling and going through. Hey, this is your place. Jesus is your place. These can be your people. He invites you to sorting out your confusion. When we follow the light of the world, we're formed in the ability to be able to separate light from darkness. And when we do that, we can begin to make good moral judgments as we live into the light with one another. Jesus says to us, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. The reality is the world around us is full of darkness, right? And it's being called light. Your culture has called good evil, or called evil good and good evil, and there is a relentless campaign strongly rooting against the light and liberty of Christ. But here's the deal. We learn this at the very onset of John. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness shall not overcome it. That's what we learn. Well, I learned some of this the hard way. Uh, I had been a Christian for only a, a couple of years. Okay, maybe more like four years at this point. And my wife and I were uh, living in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're doing some ministry. I shouldn't say that part because this makes the story worse. Um, but uh, my aunt lived in the San Francisco Bay Area. We lived in the southeast San Francisco Bay Area. And we were going to meet in San Francisco for dinner. She wanted to take us to this restaurant that she had been talking about. And so uh, it had been like a hectic day of some sort. I'm not exactly sure why, but my wife helped me discern darkness and move towards light. Here's why. We had basically left our house in the southeast San Francisco Bay Area. Now, if you've been there, you know that traffic is really unpredictable you can make plans all you want, but basically you're just going to get there when you get there, okay? And we had basically left about five minutes prior to when we were supposed to be meeting at the actual restaurant, okay? It's not going to work. So we get in the car, we look at each other, and this is not going to work. So I call my aunt and I say, hey, we're running behind, we're on our way, we'll be there shortly, or something like that. Something not true is what I said, okay? And I hang up the phone, and my wife says, why did you do that? Why did you just lie like that? And she was absolutely right, and we were absolutely late to the restaurant. Some of you are already thinking, like, if, if I have an appointment with this guy, <laughs> what's going to actually happen? My wife had called me on this deceit because I had just, nobody had to teach me how to lie. I mean, nobody had to teach you how to lie. And uh, the family of origin that I grew up in, this was pretty natural. To this day, because of the shift from deceit to truth, I try to be super accurate about my whereabouts and how long it's actually going to take me when I'm headed somewhere. So if I'm leaving, I'm leaving. If I'm on my way, I'm actually on my way. It's one of the ways that in this very moment in the San Francisco Bay Area that's been transported into my life 20-some years later. Because of the ways that I was formed in my family, because of the ways that I've had to submit my life to Christ, this is one of the ways that I have to practice godliness and virtue is just be very explicit with telling the truth. Because as we follow Jesus, we're formed to discern light from darkness. And this light is actually Jesus Christ himself. He is the object of our faith. So we follow him wherever he takes us, not wherever we want. He becomes our inner possession. We have him. He abides with us. We abide in him. He is the light of life. 
and the life itself is the light of life. So friends, following Jesus helps us to discern light from darkness. Third, following Jesus forms us to understand true freedom. There's true freedom and there's false freedom. And following Jesus brings us to our senses and allows us to experience actual, true freedom. John chapter 8, verses 31 through 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now the world's definition of freedom is the absence of constraint. And we've come to believe that to be free means no one gets to tell me what to do. No one should put constraints on me. No one should stop me from doing whatever it is I desire to do. The culture's taught us to see freedom as freedom from. Freedom from authority. Freedom from limitation. Freedom from my own body and the constraints that it places upon me. But friends, you see, true freedom isn't freedom from, it's freedom for. You're only free if you're free to give yourself for others in the ways that God has designed you to give yourself away. Single or divorced people, come along with me on this analogy, even if it doesn't apply to your current circumstances. But here's the thing. Christian marriage is freedom for the world asks, why would you want to get married? Marriage is restricting. Marriage is going to lock you up. Marriage, marriage is going to lock you up relationally. It's going to lock you up sexually. It's going to lock you up financially. Why would you want that? Here's why. People who want to experience true freedom in marriage want that because inside the fence of Christian freedom or Christian marriage is immense freedom. It's not constraining, it's freedom. Once I'm bound to one woman or one man, I'm free to love that person with all that I have within me and then relate to other people as brothers or sisters in Christ or neighbors. It's not constraining, it's actually freedom. The covenantal bond of Christian marriage is just that, it's a covenant between a man and a woman, with God as the overseer. It's a bond. And that binding creates freeing exhale to be who I really am. To be loved and to love for who I really am. It's a bond when I'm sick and when I'm dying, or when I'm healthy and when I'm thriving. It's a bond that creates immense relational freedom. There's less fret for who you need to present yourself to be. And there's more freedom for who I actually get to be and can be because it's a sanctifying institution as well. And that's the way that God has set it up. So marriage is freedom for. If I buy into the culture's definition of freedom, I'll never actually be free. Hear that. If you buy into the culture's definition of freedom, you'll never actually be Free, But if you follow Jesus, you can live into and experience true freedom. Jesus is saying to us in these verses that the truth will set us free. That means, friends, that when we follow him, he, el he helps us. He assists us. He comes alongside of us. And he helps us to understand true freedom. The world's freedom is an illusion. It keeps us entangled in our suffering and in our sorrow, but when we follow Christ, our suffering and our sorrow has a place, and the way of Jesus leads us into freedom. When we follow Jesus, we can be truly in the world without being of the world or bound to the world. We get to move freely without false attachment. We get to speak freely without fear of human rejection, and we can live with peace and joy even when you're surrounded by conflict or sadness or tension, the freedom that Christ offers us is a freedom that moves us away from our fear, from our compulsion, from our resentment and our sorrows. And it invites us to live in freedom with God 
with joy and with courage in the world. The freedom that Christ shows us in the face of God is that we can be truly free in Christ in the midst of a real hardened world. And this freedom, friends, puts our skills, it puts your life on display to a watching world desperately scrounging for hope and for lasting true freedom. It's what your neighbors want. It's what your coworkers need. Jesus said to his disciples, so if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. He says the same thing to us today. Only as we follow him can we truly be free indeed. We must follow Jesus because following is formative. I obviously have an agenda here this morning. The agenda is simply this. I want you to follow Jesus. I want you to be a disciple of Christ. But if you wait, if you wait until it all makes sense, until you, if you wait until all your questions get answered or all your loose ends get tied up, you're never going to follow him. His kingdom is not of this world, so it doesn't make sense to our natural minds. What you got to do instead, what you have to do, is what Andrew and Simon did. You just got to get up, you got to drop your net, you got to burn your boat, and you got to follow him. Because following him is formative, and only by following in the way of Jesus will the kingdom of Jesus start to make sense to you. And here's the good news. Anybody can get in on this. You can follow him. The good news about the kingdom of God is that by grace, there are zero prerequisites. You don't have to get your life together. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to deal with all of your doubts. You can bring all of that and your shame and whatever else I haven't mentioned along with you for the journey. He welcomes us just as we are because of his grace. And the other good news is that he doesn't leave us in the bondage of those things once we're journeying along with him. He meets us in those things, and he invites us into a journey of freedom. Christ has done it all for us. Jesus has done everything for us. All we must do is follow him. Obedience, light, freedom, this is the life that we actually want. It's the good life. And here's the other good news. I'm on three good newses now. You ready? While I have to follow Christ alone, I'm not alone. While I must follow Christ alone, I'm never actually alone. That's what we're doing here today. The church of Christ is here. It's where God meets us. It's where his people gather to renew their commitment to Christ and to be bound together and to, to band together to keep living into obedience, to keep living into the light, and to keep living into true freedom. So let's, let's go together now and ask God to keep just pouring fuel on that fire. Would you pray with me as we follow Christ together? Lord, we acknowledge right away that we don't always follow you. We know that following you is the good life, and yet we are so distracted. We're prone to other loves. We wander. Would you rekindle our love for you and for the good life? Would you rekindle our love for obedience? Would you move us from darkness to light? Would you move us from false freedom to true freedom? Pray for my friends here who have yet to obey you, have yet to walk in the light, and have yet to experience true freedom. Would you give it to them now? Would they today decide with everything that they have within them, but mostly because of just your grace to them today and the grace of this word in John one in John 8, in John 21, that you invite them to just follow you and you will meet them along the way. And Lord, for us who 
have been following but have wandered, would you rekindle us now even as we come to the communion table? Realign us, reorient us, and help us. We pray these things in your son's good name. Amen. Well, friends, Jesus Christ now invites us to his table. So let all sinners who are grieved and humbled by their sin, let all the weak who need their faith to be strengthened, let all who love the triune God yet wish to love him more come now to the table of our Lord. The scriptures tell us that on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord took bread and broke it, and he said to his disciples, this is my body which is given for you. And likewise, he took a cup and he said, this is the new covenant of my blood. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. All who come to this table should come in humility and self-examination because these are holy things for holy people. Those among us who have not yet come to Jesus in faith and baptism should not yet partake, but instead use this time as prayer and reflection. And if there are any here who are under the discipline of the church, this church or any other church, or who are unwilling to repent of their sin, let them be warned of God's judgment on hypocrisy. But for all who hope and for all who humbly come to the Lord Jesus, be assured that your sins and your vices should not keep you from this table. Christ welcomes his people to come and to find strength and to find healing. The way that we practice communion here at Cormdale Church is you'll come out of the left side of your section, come down, a server will place bread uh, into your hands, and then you can take uh, a cup of wine or juice from this table and proceed down the right side of your section back to your seat, and you're free to partake of that communion, those communion elements anytime during the service. If you need a gluten-free option, that will be available at the back of the sanctuary. And if you're in the balcony, feel free to come forward and receive and make your way anywhere you want to take communion. Come now as you are ready.
my heart to run to you But when temptation comes my way When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay Teach my heart to run to you when temptation comes my way When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay Resolve to 
seek thy face. We resolve to seek thy face. We resolve to seek thy face. We resolve to seek thy face. particularly experience God's power and presence when we pray with others. And so if you'd like to pray, please come up after service and sit in this first row and myself and other pastors and prayer team members will be ready to pray with you. So now people of God, receive this benediction. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit abide and remain with us now and throughout our time on earth until the day of his return. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.